I want to do something a little different. I want to tell you a story. And it's really a story of, of you know, the first failure was my failure to use the slides probably. The, the story is of a personal failure. And really how I learned to bring new ideas to life, not by success, but by failing. And I co-founded and was CEO of a telecommunications software company for 15 years. And we brought all sorts of new products into the marketplace, some successfully, some not so successfully. And I left there and realized that I didn't know how to create a world-class company. I could create a small company. I could create a company that was profitable. It grow, grew nicely, but I could not create a world-class company. So I started on a project for many years to figure that out by doing research. But along the way, I came up with another opportunity. And that was at Synamics, our biggest problem was in strategy execution. We would make the most lovely plans every year. We'd document them very well. But at the end of the year, only half of them got executed. And so I sat and wondered, what was it? And I read in Harvard Business Review, and they probably teach at Rotman, that strategy execution is the biggest problem in business today. So I thought, hey, eh, I'll start a company doing strategy execution. So I got together with a few friends, started a company that was supposed to help companies do strategy execution, and it totally bombed. <laughs> Absolutely total failure, couldn't find a single customer, really had trouble getting people to talk to us. And a fundamental reason for this is that we had what was called imaginary friends. Did all of you have imaginary friends when you were a kid? The, the great thing about imaginary friends is they do exactly what you want. And this is what happens to entrepreneurs, is they have imaginary friends until they get out into the marketplace. And the imaginary friends, of course, are going to buy what they've got. Well, imaginary friends are great, but 40% of startups fail because there's no market need. And there's no market need because people have imaginary friends. So if you can imagine um, what it's like for a consumer of innovation, this is what's essential to understanding how to bring ideas to life, to understand what a consumer is going through. And if you are like every other consumer out there, you're going to be triggered into buying something by changes in your life. And there are four types of changes. There are operational changes, regulatory changes, strategic changes, and financial changes. And that's pretty well the order in which people make decisions to innovate. They get rid of their operational problems. Their phone is broken, they need a new phone. They get rid of the regulatory problems. The boss says, I have to have an iPhone and I can't use this lovely old Blackberry. They get rid of strategic ones if they have time left over from solving the operational and regulatory runs. And finally, they'll seek to save money. Now, unfortunately, mechanics went out there and found there was no trigger. Not only that, that there has to be a trigger, but people have to have a budget for purchasing. And we went out there and found there is nobody with a to-do list that includes get better at strategy execution and nobody with a budget for software for strategy execution. First problem. Second problem was Cloud Cuckoo Land. So Cloud Cuckoo Land is sort of like having an imaginary friends and it's another world that if you can go to Aristophanes you can read about Cloud Cuckoo Land. Um, People don't react positively to innovation. There are all sorts of barriers, and the behavioral economists amongst us talk about the barriers to innovation, people, the learning costs, the uh, status quo bias, the endowment effect, all sorts of barriers exist. Well, we went out there with a product that was so complex that people would have to re-engineer their entire operations to be able to put it into effect. Now, it worked because we were from small companies and it was possible to do that. But when you approach a large company with an idea that says, you've got to learn how to use this software and change your whole approach to management at the same time, you've erected a significant barrier that even if there were a strong trigger, it's almost impossible to get over. So we got out there. We failed from the fact that there was no trigger. We failed from the fact that there were strong barriers. And the last one is the Invisible Man, and I'm sorry that I used a man here instead of a woman, but there is no movie called The Invisible Woman from whom I could steal a, uh, a visual, so I thought of that when I did it, not later. Oh, by the way, as a CEO for 15 years, I, I really liked where I sat on your chart on the bottom right. <laughs> I'm only glad that I'm not a lawyer or particularly a politician, which was pointed out to me is uh, on the very bottom and far to the left. Um, but beside that, the invisible man is what most people are when they bring out products. 
They aren't sufficiently differentiated from the competition in terms of quality, speed, or cost. And when you go out to the marketplace with an undifferentiated competitive approach, you will fail. Nowadays in the world, people are looking for very, very strong markers of differentiation. And in fact, there's a nine times effect. Consumers overvalue the benefits of what they have by three times. Innovators overvalue the benefits of what they're bringing to the market by three times. And you have to get over this nine times differential in your product uh, performance in order to be able to break through from a competitive standpoint. So, We've got three major issues getting in the way of bringing these ideas to life. People aren't triggered, there are barriers, and you've got to really be disruptive. So why is Uber so successful? And it's really interesting to look at Uber from, a, um, from an entrepreneur's perspective because you know, there were a number of ride-sharing companies that came out into the marketplace at the same time. And in fact, there were two or three that did not succeed because they couldn't attract the capital that Lyft attracted. But Uber, for a number of reasons, was successful. But if you put this framework of triggers, barriers, and competitive differentiation together, you can see what's happening with, you, with Uber. They went out there, and people are already triggered to go someplace. People know, you get up in the morning, you have to go from A to B. You have a choice of how you go from A to B, and you make that choice every day. Do I drive my car? Do I take the subway? Do I uh, take a taxi? Do I walk? So that decision was being made. It's on someone's to-do list every single day to accomplish. So as you're going through the day, there are all sorts of opportunities to, to, for Uber to interact with you where you have to make a decision. You are already triggered to do something. So, the second thing is very important, is that there are relatively few barriers. When you look at what you're, how you're getting to work, um, you have a need and you have money, so the money issue is taken care of. There is no endowment effect, meaning that um, you aren't in love with the taxi, you probably aren't in love with the TTC, for those of you who commute on a regular basis. So you're willing to try new things because you don't have these long-term endowments, you don't own the, uh, an, a relationship with your transportation. You also have very low learning costs. You probably have a smartphone, I'd be surprised if anyone here didn't have a smartphone. So you're used to ordering things online, you're used to using your smartphone to get access to things. So there's no learning curve involved in this. Now interestingly enough, when you look at what happened in Iowa last night at the caucus, what you're dealing with was a regulatory trigger and a very steep learning curve for a population that wasn't used to it. It was bound to fail if you'd went through any analysis. So but Uber came into the marketplace where there were strong triggers and very, very few barriers. But the last thing and the most important thing is something that I thought they've done brilliantly. And this is something that, uh, that people haven't realized yet is happening in the world of competition, is that companies are coming to compete on all three bases simultaneously. People used to say you could only really choose to compete on quality, on speed, or on costs. And you have a blue ocean strategy, you might be able to compete on two variables, but there are three or four successful companies, Uber being one of them, Google being another, and Amazon being a third, that have figured out how to compete on all three bases simultaneously. First, in terms of quality, Uber came out there with a very much better ordering system. There, I mean, except if you live at Bay and Bloor and can walk out and flag a cab, you have a problem getting uh, a taxi. So they've got a great ordering system and they also have a great payment system. So they've taken care of quality except for the fact that the Uber drivers tend to get lost near the airport. Uh, we won't hold that against them. The quality issue is taken care of. The speed issue is being taken care of in a very interesting way in that they might not be faster at getting to you, they might not be faster at driving you anywhere, but what they are is a known time. So when you order, you get that great little map. Does everybody watch the car approach? Yeah, I wonder if I'm the only person standing on the road sometime watching these little cars drive through. But that changes your perception of speed while not changing your speed absolutely. Because you actually know when the car will arrive. If you phone Beck Taxi, you have the faintest idea what time the car is going to arrive. It's, yeah, we'll get your car. And you'll stand there waiting forever, not knowing whether it's going to come or not. So your whole 
uh, personal relationship with speed has changed. The third dimension, they did an interesting thing. They changed the cost. But they changed the cost in two ways. They lowered the regular cost and increased for surge pricing to make up for that. So they've addressed quality, cost, and speed, and in disrupting the industry, are out there and so different from taxis, which is, let's say, the, the normal uh, competitor to it, that they've really made a, few, a huge difference. Bringing ideas to life, the key I found is dependent on overcoming humans' natural tendency not to change or to try new things. Those of you, how many people bought something new when they went grocery shopping last time? 10% of you. Now you probably think of yourselves as innovators. That's only 10% in a basket of $100, you're buying one new thing. You have ads affecting you every day to get you to innovate. You aren't naturally trying new things on a regular basis. And we have to overcome people's natural tendency not to try new things. And the way you do that is to appeal to the things that already trigger them, to develop products and services that get over their barriers, and to be radically different. To be so different that you can't help but be noticed. And if you want any more on this, my current fun is the Narwhal Project where I'm attempting to understand what it takes to scale companies. And you can read more of this in Triggers and Barriers. Thank you very much.